Hi there, welcome. Welcome to Homekeepers. Hey, grab yourself a cup of tea and join us today. It's always such a pleasure to connect like this, you know, wherever you are. And we're here in Central Florida, but uh, through the wonder of television, we can get together and, and learn things together. Uh, there's always things that we can learn and enlarge our borders, you know. I think we have that kind of guest today, Dr. Grady McMurtry. He was with me several years ago. And uh, he is a professor, and he, uh, his main message, which he takes in various parts of the world, is creationism. In fact, he wrote a book called Creation, Our Worldview. Interestingly, he used to be an atheist who believed totally in Darwinism and evolution. And um, so I'm so glad to have him back. Uh, I think what's interesting is as we move along in this world, you know, new things come up and new discoveries. It seems like the, the new discoveries always enhance the creation story and they kind of make the evolution thing a little bit more wobbly than it already is. Uh, we are going to be offering this book. Now, we offered it years ago, but it's updated now uh, for your gift of um, $25. And uh, while you take that information, I'm going to join Stephanie in the kitchen and we are going to make uh, cream chicken tacos. Is that right? Cream cheese. Cream cheese, chicken tacos. chicken tacos. And uh, I think this is something you will want. I said to Stephanie earlier, I wonder who thought of this? It's a, really a different instrument, uh, different recipe. And uh, so that information has been up on your screen and we'll put it up later. I think you will want a copy of this book and something you need to be teaching your children because you know what they're getting in school. You know what they're getting in school. Yeah, so, not good. Want, want them to know the truth. The Bible yes. says truth will set you free. Amen. Okay, what are you doing? Okay, this is going to be so good. <laughs> I don't know why I try to lose weight. I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have corn tortillas, and I'm, I just have a little bit of oil in the pan, mm -hmm. and I'm just frying them up a little bit. I also have a block of cream cheese that I've melted down a little bit. We're going to put in a cup of cheese. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, come on, you can't go wrong. And uh, a clove of chopped up garlic. You oh. want your rotisserie chicken or you could bake your own. Yep. We yep. got one from the store. Yep, we got the rotisserie. Again, you, on a Sunday afternoon, if you had time, you stick some chicken breasts in the oven. You mm -hmm. let them cook low and slow, and then you have a wonderful chicken breast for You had meal. one for lunch today. When did you yes. When did you grill it? I grilled that over the week. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. It sure Towards looked good. She was fixing a big yep. salad so, with let me get chicken this in one it. out. I'm gonna put another one in. It calls mm -hmm. for 10 tortillas. Mm -hmm. Let me get that one going. Let me get the chicken. You just get, spray the pan and then uh -huh. stand there and look pretty. Kay? Okay. I, so this is I'll two cups of chicken. And we're just melting this all together with salt and pepper. You know, when, um, when we were working on that earlier, I think some fresh tomatoes would be good in it. Oh, I mean, you could go anywhere with yeah. this. This is a base. Uh -huh. This is a base, and then you could do anything you wanted in here. Jalapenos. Mm -hmm. <gasps> yes, ma'am. You wouldn't like that, but I would. Mm -hmm. You could go spicy. You could, oh, I'm again, this is just a base. Grease and off. You, you can go anywhere with it. Well. So I'm just mixing this all up. And then it's so simple. We have a sprayed aluminum pan. Do you think people might like this for the Super Bowl? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Do you uh, fix something for a Super Bowl? We get wings every year. That's our tradition. That's a we get we just we get wings and okay. Yeah. Um, this um, this might re-air ten years from now, but who right? are you going to be rooting for? <laughs> okay, so this year it's Kansas City and San Francisco, oh. and I'm going to have to go for Kansas City because I like Mahomes. Well, um, I'm going for Kansas City. My daddy was a pastor there for 19 years. I um, learned to lead a choir there, mm -hmm. and I worked in a bank. Uh, before I went to college, and it holds a lot of great memories of me. You know, a former President Truman uh, lived there. This okay. was after he was out of office, lived in Independence, which is really part of Kansas City. And anybody as old as I am, you know that he always took a walk every day. Sometimes he'd walk past my bank. Get out. Yeah, he had some kind of secret service with him. I've been that close to him. Wow. I tell you, he had the greatest smile I think I've ever seen. 
it just lit up. Now today, I would step right up and say, "Hi, Mr. President," but I was too stupid yeah, then. then. Or yeah, yeah. Too uh, you were young. shy, you dumb. Were young. Now listen, mm. it always cracks me up when you post things about football on Facebook <laughs> <laughs> because I know our Slater. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not too savvy. But she she hears things on, or she sees things on the news and then she'll put because everyone yes. need, it needs to be in the know. So mm -hmm. you just take your yummy already mm -hmm. crisped up. And you just and I would with say use your business. imagination to putting yes, other things in there. Yes, you put other stuff in here, and then you lay them in a nine by mm -hmm. thirteen pan, mm -hmm. and then you bake them for a little bit, and that makes them even crunchier. Yes, yes. So it's almost like twice baked mm -hmm. tortillas with this yummy. I mean, we tasted the. I'm not. We're not going to lie. We may have tasted the insides earlier while we were making. We them, might right? have. Because how can you not? And I mean, here it's cream is the cheese. It's cheese. It's chicken. So you have these, and you know good and well as they have been baked. Yes. Uh, they're crispier, and your filling is just more married. Oh more. yeah. So you can. Oh, there's just, and there's this so many ways you you could just cover that with lettuce and tomato. That's and what they cheese. look like. Uh huh. Yeah. I'll take a bite if you want me to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you mind my fingers? No, not at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, and it's oh, that's nice and crunchy. It's very. I love it's very crunchy. crunchy. Uh huh. Mm. <laughs> it's hot. Excuse me, she's having a moment. That shell <laughs> is so good. Yeah, I said that really unusual. Baked is the way to go. Yeah, because that is yeah. so nice and crunchy. And just, if you just take the idea of the tortillas and put your own stuff in them, I mean, they're yes. just crispier. Yes, you could do oh. cream cheese mm -hmm. and just vegetables. Mm -hmm. If you you could do meat. anything with it, but I mean, it's a great idea yeah, so the way many. they treat the tortillas. Yes. Yeah, so okay. Um, the recipe is coming up on the screen, and you can uh, take it, or you, there's many ways you can get it, so get one that's convenient for you. And after that, I will uh, meet my friend again after many years, Dr. Grady McMurtry. Uh, very educational. Pay attention. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, you may receive it by contacting us through social media as listed on the screen. When requesting a copy through the mail, be sure to include a self-addressed stamped envelope. Thank you, and please know we always appreciate hearing from our viewers. Well, in past years, uh, Dr. McMurtry has been with me, and welcome back. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here again. I know. I think it's been too long because um, this is a subject we ought to tackle once in a while. <clears throat> and the reason I say that is because evolution probably changes a little bit from time to time, but creationism doesn't. Creationism doesn't. Now, a good scientist always uses new information. Mm -hmm. Not to change their opinion, but to simply mm -hmm. gain the information to share with others as further proof that creation is true and that evolution is false. But through the years, I remember when um, DNA was discovered and the genome was discovered, it set shockwaves in the evolutionists and the Darwinist mm -hmm. camp. But uh, creationism, all, all we do is learn more wonder about it. Well, the fact of the matter is, if you take a look at Charles Darwin, he thought a cell was nothing more than a Ziploc bag full of jello. He knew absolutely nothing mm -hmm. about the complexity of a cell. He knew nothing about DNA. If he had known those things, I really don't believe he could have believed in evolution in the first place. Yeah, I think um, some of the stuff I've read and heard, I think he had some doubts. Well, the fact of the matter. Evolution. Well. He never doubted evolution in the sense that the more he wrote about it, the more convinced mm -hmm. he was. And he, he did not die a Christian. That's a mythology that, of course, has gone around. Um, but he did realize that what he was promoting was atheism, and that did trouble him. Mm -hmm. You have to remember the only degree that he ever earned at any university was a Bachelor of Arts in Christian Theology, Christ College, Cambridge. No kidding. No, I didn't know that. That was the only degree he ever earned. Well, I think we need to kind of go over a little bit of your background because you uh, were in a very, very liberal part of California. <laughs> we know what Berkeley is today. Yes. And you taught, you taught evolution. I did. Junior high and high school for how long? And at the university level, too. At the university. Uh, I was born in San Francisco, 
but I was raised at the four, age of four and a half, we moved over to Berkeley because my father was not only a student at Berkeley, but he became a teaching professor at Berkeley. And before we left, uh, he has, was at that time a secretary to the presidents. So I grew up in a very heavily evolutionary area. Uh, and when I wasn't learning evolution in the public schools, I was spending my time in the paleontology laboratories at the University of California, Berkeley, learning about dinosaurs, fossils, evolutionary theory as a child. And so that carried on through my early part of my work, uh, my first and second degrees in science were earned in evolution. And so I was an evolutionary teacher as well as a believer. Um, but I would teach in junior high school, senior high school, and at the college level about evolution. But eventually... Did you I, have questions? I mean, as, as you kept getting more deeply involved in it and all, did you have things come up and say, oh, I don't know about that? Not so much that, because uh, I was not a militant evolutionist. I was not a militant atheist. I wasn't the Richard Dawkins kind of person at all. To me, and I think most people, if you're only taught one side of an issue, you tend to think it's true. And the problem with all government-run schools, whether it's here or in any of the other countries that I do mission work in, Russia, South Africa, Brazil, Japan, is that the government schools don't teach critical thinking. They only teach one side of the issue. And so that's not education, it's indoctrination. And so I was indoctrinated, but I wasn't militant. But that's true of our higher learning. Our oh, today it's rampant. Today it is absolutely rampant. In fact, they quiet voices that are opposite. Well, it has become so liberal that now you have, uh, I've just looked at recent numbers as a matter of fact, over half of the millennials believe that the First Amendment should be changed to restrict speech. Yes, I didn't know they believed that, but it's obvious in the way they behave. It's the way they behave, but we, recent studies have actually shown that they do. More than half of them believe that the First Amendment should be changed to prevent free speech rather than to have free speech, mm -hmm. which of course is disastrous to our culture, our society, our history. Yeah, and I think we need to review a little bit how you as a teacher of evolution on so many levels became a Christian and a creationist. Well, and you talked about my doubts. I didn't really doubt it so much. But I simply thought if it was true, God was irrelevant. It wasn't a militancy at all. It was just an irrelevancy. But I did have people try to witness to me. You know, I had Christians who tried to witness ineffectively because they were using the wrong bait. Mm -hmm. The bait for me, as the Holy Spirit would eventually use it, was the intellect. But I also saw Christians walking before me in a good Christian walk, and that was a good witness, but it wasn't effective to winning me. And what had to happen was, at the age of 27, I simply said, enough's enough. I mean, you, you couldn't grow up in our time frame. You know, I'm a boomer, early boomer, and, and you couldn't grow up in the 40s, 50s, 60s in the United States without knowing something about Christianity. I mean, that's obvious. And so you know about the claims of Christ, you know about the claims of Christianity. But at the age of 27, I simply decided to decide for myself whether Jesus was telling the truth or not. Because if he was, then I needed to become a Christian. If he wasn't, I needed to go into something else. There can only be one correct religion. Mm -hmm. And so at the 20, age of 27, in a self-directed study, although I look back and realize the Holy Spirit was guiding right. me, but, but no human being was guiding me. I did a six-month study looking at, was Jesus telling the truth? Was he God? Was he the Son of God as he proclaimed, which is very obvious, or was he a liar? Now, this is an ancient argument. It wasn't new with me. It was new for me, but it's certainly not new with me. Mm -hmm. And after six months, I studied histories outside the Bible, read the Bible for the first time, looked at the, the Gospels as legal depositions, really, because right. that's what they are, eyewitness accounts. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have roughly a dozen historians who do recognize the existence of Jesus Christ at his time. It isn't just the Bible. It isn't just Josephus. There are many other historians as well. Mm -hmm. And so his historical reality is not in question. The question is who is he, right. what is he? Right. But at the end of six months I became a Christian when I realized that all the histories and the Bible lined up. But the most convincing piece of evidence, and I'm a scientist, was that over 500 people were willing to die without recanting, having seen him after the resurrection. No one will voluntarily die for a lie. 
and therefore, therefore having over 500 people willingly die without recanting was absolute proof of the resurrection. Was, were your viewpoints on evolution changed immediately? No, because of course when I did become a Christian, I had a problem. My big problem was, how can you have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe and be an evolutionist? They're, they're contradictory. I don't believe there's a creator. <laughs> there, there's 180 degrees opposite. Uh, no view of evolution is consistent with the Bible, period. And so I had a problem, but I knew I had a problem. And so I took my academic, my scholastic skills. After all, I've got two doctorates. You might think I had some. And, and attacked the problem, starting with a blank piece of paper. Was what I had learned and taught others okay that God had used an evolutionary process to create? Or was what I had learned and taught others wrong? And it, he really brought it into existence whole, complete, 6,000 years ago. Six literal 24-hour days. And after 16 months of studying natural law, natural process, physical evidence, I came to the conclusion there is no science to support evolution at all. It's a, it's a religion. Where did they get all the billions of years and millions? They, they made it up. You see, that's just, evolution, is, evolution is a religion, and it's a religion that has certain specific tenets. One of the tenets is you have to believe that one kind of organism can change into a different kind, into a different kind, into a different kind over millions and billions of years. The second tenet is you must believe in millions and billions of years because no scientist, no matter how art the evolutionist might be, could possibly believe that the evolutionary process had only taken thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of years. They know it has to be millions and billions to fit their belief. Well, where are their evolutionary bones? You know what I'm saying? It, well, they have the bones. To but, prove what? But, but you have to think about something for a second. There are bones in the ground, dinosaurs, mm -hmm. bones mm -hmm. of people, apes. Right, right. There are, there are even fossils of single-celled organisms. But remember, creationists and evolutionists have the same physical evidence. What we have is two different interpretations of the evidence. And so the question becomes, which of the two interpretations is more scientifically correct? And for us as Christians, which two mm -hmm. interpretations certainly line up with the biblical authority? Because the Bible must come first. But true science supports every statement in the Bible that has a scientific basis. Now, the Bible has supernatural truths as well. But when it comes to natural truths, the Bible is always correct. And so we see that the physical evidence of dinosaur fossils in the ground is far more consistent with a worldwide flood 4,500 right, years ago. Right, and it's not a changing. That's right. You, you don't find a dinosaur bone here, and then here's one that's a little bit different. And, uh, e e even the greatest evolutionary authorities, like Dr. Stephen Jay Gould, who was, by background, a paleontologist and a historian, mm -hmm. Even he agreed that there were no transitional right. forms. That was the word I was looking for. <laughs> and so when you have even the greatest of evolution science, and so what he said was, in essence, that evolution occurred too fast to see. Oh, okay. Charles Darwin said it occurred too slow to see. Mm -hmm. Because Charles Darwin realized there were no transitional forms. Right. And he said, well, it was so slow you couldn't see it. But that was his yeah, micro-evolutionary right. view. Stephen Jay Gould and others said, well, there are no transitionary fossils because evolution occurs too fast to see and the, the times of transition were not captured in the fossil record. Yeah, there you go, okay. Um, okay, now, what about a Christian who receives the Lord and all that, and maybe they don't even think that much about it, but they, they probably believe in evolution, that's what they were taught somewhere down the road. Most Christians believe in evolution because that's what they were taught in school, as mm -hmm. I was. So mm -hmm. I, I'm very sympathetic. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that for those who claim Christianity, claim Jesus as their Savior, they can still go to heaven, even if they believe in millions and billions of years, that the age of the earth, the age of the universe, is not the salvation issue. Right. We must remember the salvation right. issue is what is your relationship with the Father mm -hmm. through the Son, mm -hmm. period. However... The age of the earth and the age of the universe are critical to the gospel. So it's not the salvation issue. I will never make it the salvation issue, but it is critical to the gospel. Think with me for a moment. Why would you want to believe in millions and billions of years, whether you're a Christian or not? It is to believe that life and death have been going on for millions and billions of supposed years. Now, if life and death of what the Bible calls in Hebrew a nefesh organism, now nefesh organism, 
This is the Hebrew word for life, soul, blood. You know, the Bible says the life is in the blood. Mm -hmm. And nefesh refers to life, soul, blood. Soul is the intellect, emotion, and will. Now, if you believe in any way whatsoever in millions and billions of years, you believe that life and death, including nefesh organisms, plants are not nefesh organisms, insects are not nefesh organisms, but everything from a shrew to an elephant to a dinosaur are nefesh organisms, and that includes also people. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not animals, but we have nefesh also. And so you would believe that these nefesh organisms, which have life, soul, blood, intellect, emotion, will, have been living and dying over millions and billions of supposed years. Mm -hmm. Now, if that were true, it would negate Romans 5.12. It would negate 1 Corinthians 15. It would create, you know, create a huge problem because Paul tells us that it is only through the sin of the first man, Adam, that Adam. death came into the universe. Yeah. And that death is of nefesh organisms. And so if you believe in millions and billions of years, what you're doing, whether you realize it or not, and I'm not saying it's intentional, but you're denying the power of the cross. Mm -hmm. you, you may not realize it. You need somebody right. to explain it to you. But you're denying the power of the cross because if the first man, Adam's sin, mm -hmm. did not bring death, if it wasn't the causative agent mm -hmm. of death coming into the universe, then the death of the second Adam, as Jesus is referred to, cannot take it away. Yeah, the interesting thing too is um, it's all that's taught in our schools and teachers in higher learning education have been fired because they believed in creationism. There, it's not, it's not criti critical thinking. It's said. not critical thinking. Mm -hmm. It's teaching a lie and I say that categorically. The interpretation of the evidence from an evolution standpoint is mm -hmm. unsupportable scientifically. Mm -hmm. It is simply a faith statement made so demonstratively that people are forced to believe it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I tell students, you want to get an A in any course you ever take. Learn what they teach you, give it back the way they want it. You'll get an A every time. But you didn't hear me say it had to be right. Right. <laughs> That's true. Uh, we're about to run out of time. I did want to uh, bring up the fact that uh, Dr. McMurtry teaches various, various parts of the world. In Russia, you've been many times, and those students have only been taught evolution. So when you come in with this fairy tale of creationism, how is it accepted? Well, first of all, of course, creation isn't a fairy tale. No. But, 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 when, I, but when I do go to Russia, and I've been 55 times to Russia since mm -hmm. July of 94, and I've been teaching exactly the same thing I teach here or in the U.K. or anyplace else, I think you were familiar with that statement, there's a certain ring to truth. You know, when you hear a statement, there's a certain ring when you hear the truth. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the students are actually then allowed to see yeah. the evidence and the interpretation that supports creation and not evolution, they will instantaneously realize that they have been lied to their whole lives. They know there's another interpretation and that it's a superior interpretation. So I have no problem when I get yeah. into schools in Russia. And you can't rule out when you go the Holy Spirit with Well, you. obviously, and, and no one comes unless the Holy Spirit draws them. But there's a power, you know, teachers have a certain power of persuasion that, again, is it the Holy Spirit or is it not? Yeah. Okay, we've got about one more minute. How is that different than when you teach in Brazil? It's not. It's not? Are they, have, are in, they in, Bra in Brazil, they're indoctrinated in evolution. Same, same thing. Yeah. Oh, like absolutely. America. Brazil has been a country that teaches evolution only in their schools. Mm -hmm. Although there may be changes in that now with the new president. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. There, it's a lot of uh, <clears throat> a lot of things going on around the world right now when it comes to the things of God and the gospel. Because he said this gospel shall be preached to all nations, and it's happening. Uh, we're out of time, but listen, he'll be with me tomorrow, and in the next couple of days, we will not only talk about evolution. We're going to talk about climate change, and how that figures into all the other things that are being taught and heralded. So stay with me. I have a couple things to say before we have to say goodbye. Arthelene would like you to keep the following information handy. You may contact Homekeepers by writing to Homekeepers, P.O. Box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758, or go to www.rippy.org. Remember, we always enjoy hearing from our viewers, and we thank you for your support.
That's interesting stuff, isn't it? I never get tired of uh, just plumbing the depths of anything more you can learn about God and certainly through creation. I've had some real experts on and they all agree that the earth is about 6,000 years old. And so kids are taught, you know, there's billions and billions of years. Uh, and so I'm going to choose to believe the scripture where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it goes on from there. Uh, let me again tell you about Creation, Our World View, which was written by my guest, Dr. McMurtry. And as I mentioned at the top of the program, we did offer this before, uh, but it's been many, many years and it has been updated. And so <clears throat> if that is your interest, and I know that it is a lot of people because when he's been on before, there's been a really great response. Uh, you can order this book for $25 uh, from the address, Box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758, or call 1-800-229-0059. You can place your order there. I was thinking of um, something that's so important, I, and I can't remember which guest brought it up, but I do know what he said, and that was... Try to find out what your child's worldview is. And there's so many things going on in our culture today that can affect that. So why don't you think about your own worldview? What, what really is that surrounding subject that makes you think what you do and, and, and then those smaller things come through that filter, sort of. We used to sing a song in Sunday school, I've decided to follow Jesus. And I hope that's my worldview, that uh, everything that I do or think, it's going to be affected by that view. And as I mentioned earlier, first verse in the Bible, in the beginning. That's what we were talking about today. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if your children, your grandchildren are not learning this in school, I can tell you that. They are learning evolution. They are learning Darwinism. And so uh, if they're going to learn the truth of this world and its history and all this, it's going to have to come from you uh, to realize that God, the God of the universe, the God of the creation, that's the one we serve. That's the one can serve us so well. We are out of time, but please join me next time. Remembering, there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a homekeeper's program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN Programs and then on Homekeepers.